we have um, Merced County represented in our first presentation, and we have Kathleen Grassi and Christine Sullivan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathleen Grassi. I'm the Public Health Director in Merced County, and I really want to thank um, the organizers of today's um, workshop and all of you for inviting us and including us in the information sharing um, opportunity today. So what I'm going to do is uh, give you a, a 60,000 foot overview of the work that we've been doing in Merced for the last three years and then I'm going to turn it over to Kristen here who's going to give you an, a more in-depth example of some of the work that we've been doing or at least one of the projects that we've been doing. So uh, we are also funded by Blue Shield of California Foundation, and we have been for the last uh, four years, um, but in particular the last three years we formed the Whole Health Partnership, uh, and the uh, uh, organizations that are listed here on the um, slide are the members of our Whole Health Partnership. So we've been fortunate enough to have um, the Alliance as a strong partner, um, but also to our two largest uh, federally qualified health centers, which both of which have integrated primary care and behavioral health services, uh, our largest hospital, which is a Dignity Health affiliate, and their rural health clinic um, have been active participants, as well as the county behavioral health department, which includes uh, substance use disorder programs and county public health, uh, and we have a community representation as well. So the public health department, um, I should just explain, in Merced County does not do direct care of any sort. We do not have a county hospital. We do not have county primary care clinics. And so we were in the unique position uh, to be a, a neutral uh, facilitator for this, these conversations over the last three years. So in the first year, we spent a lot of time um, uh, trying to get gather information about what some of the gaps are in our community in regards to services and what some of the uh, perceptions and um, behaviors are, uh, both on the provider side as well as on the consumer side. So without going into a lot of depth in regards to the uh, outcomes of the surveying that we did, uh, just hitting some high points, we started uh, with a consumer engagement survey um, at where we really wanted to uh, get a strong feel for um, uh, how our uh, clients were perceiving uh, the availability of services in our community and if they'd be willing to use those. So remember this was in 2014-15, so the Affordable Care Act had just been um, uh, implemented. Uh, our um, be uh, Medi-Cal beneficiary uh, population grew by uh, 30,000 uh, in Merced County, uh, integrated uh, behavioral health and primary care was something that was a shift for, on both the provider side as well as the consumer side. Uh, we, we actually talked to just under 500 uh, individuals in our community and got um, a, a very simplified survey results in regards to how they perceived um, uh, service availability and whether they'd be willing to use that. So interestingly enough, um, we had comments like uh, uh, alcoholism really isn't seen as a disorder, it's seen as a social issue, um, and that, uh, that folks don't know where to go for help. So we, we got a, a strong sense that, that uh, our population was really not tuned into the need to seek services, and in particular, not to seek services at a primary care setting. Um, so the, um, there was a strong feeling of taboo uh, that I don't want to bring up with my primary care physician the fact that I may be depressed or anxious or I might uh, have a drug problem because he, she won't want to see me anymore or they might turn me in. Uh, some sort of negative consequence may occur. Trust factor was a big one. And then uh, really, again, uh, just not seeing it as a problem or a problem to be brought to primary care. And something that we heard over and over again was, well, that's my, my doc that deals with my physical health. They don't know how to, tr how to help me in regards to behavioral health issues, mental health issues or substance abuse issues. So a big um, uh, divide there in regards to uh, uh, primary care as a source for that kind of help. 
Um, we also brought our partners together, a larger group of our partners, to try to identify the work that we needed to do over the last three years. And the highlighted uh, two, theme two, one and two, were at the top, and really focused on uh, really thinking about cultural competency, really thinking about um, uh, reducing stigma in the community around behavioral health uh, needs, and then uh, really uh, thinking about how we can use data and electronic communication as a, a part of uh, improving our continuity of care. So in year two, we spent a lot of time uh, doing both of those things, and uh, this is just one high-level example of uh, what was really a very in-depth, year-long conversation uh, among our whole health partnership. And we, uh, with the help of Desert Vista Consulting, uh, Karen and Jen, uh, Jen, who are here in the room, um, are, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at how the flow of communication between our FQHCs and our county mental health department worked, and uh, how the flow of referrals and communication between our FQHCs and Beacon, uh, which as you know, uh, is the um, substance, of, or sorry, the uh, behavioral health provider for uh, the Alliance uh, clients. So uh, in those conversations, we discovered some of the simplest things, such as um, referrals were being made and um, on, uh, by paper and were being uh, acknowledged by paper in return. So a clinic would send a referral over to county mental health. Mental health, if the, pa uh, if the client um, showed up and was assessed and taken into services, uh, might actually then respond to the FQHC uh, via snail mail by paper saying, yes, we've seen your client and they're open for services. Um, so the uh, clinician would never receive that because it would be received by the referrals department and put in the file. Uh, and the clinician would be wondering, whatever happened to my patient? So very simple communication flows like that uh, were really what we discovered we needed to work on in order to improve continuity of care for our patients. And then these mapping um, uh, dem uh, diagrams were really helpful to us to start looking at the point, sort of the pain points or the pinch points where we could begin to smooth some of that um, communication flow and improve referrals and, and uh, feedback. Then we also provided training for our, um, our uh, clinic partners in regards to um, well-being for the mental health providers, so we really wanted to look at uh, especially our non-licensed staff who in our clinics who were um, working with or uh, transitioning uh, patients coming in from mental from the primary care to the behavioral health side of their clinic services um, really uh, thinking about what they needed to look for or how they needed to support the patient and so visioni compromiso who you may be familiar with um, provided a, a training for our uh, clinic and behavioral health staff. Mm -hmm. And then we also got our community involved through a NAMI in our own voice training that year. And then most recently this year, um, we have been uh, really looking at, uh, again, data extraction. So a lot of, you know, what, what did this patient population look like? We are currently looking at those uh, high utilizers that end up in the emergency department frequently and talking with both the emergency department staff and our clinic staff about how we can facilitate these patients' um, care so that uh, they don't get to crisis point. A and then also really uh, starting to talk about um, hard to avoid the um, opioid um, epidemic and the need for our primary care providers to be better equipped uh, to work with clients in regards to safe prescribing. And so in that vein, we recently had a uh, MAT training for um, both behavioral health and primary care providers in our community that was provided by UCLA's um, Pacific Southwest uh, Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And uh, most exciting is the fact that we, uh, as a public health department, uh, this year was funded through uh, Blue Shield of California Foundation as well as the California Endowment and several other um, philanthropic organizations to really start to build a, a, a um, accountable communities for health 
model in our uh, county. And so that's really uh, carrying forward our work in both uh, chronic disease prevention as well as behavioral health uh, integration. And um, we have been using the uh, last, uh, this last year of our Blue Shield grant to help us look at our um, patient population that bridges those um, diagnoses uh, with our FQHCs and again with our behavioral health um, service uh, partners. So Kristen is gonna get into more detail about what that particular project looks like. So what I'm gonna be talking about is our attempts at mapping this population um, in order to be able to provide geographical uh, interventions. So our population of interest for both this project and our CATCHI project are uh, people, patients who have depression as well as either heart disease or diabetes. So we're looking at this comorbid population of a behavioral health and physical health um, issue. So we wanted to do some mapping because it's visually appealing. It uh, tells a story really well. It helps us to highlight specific geographies where we might be able to invest our limited resources for best use. It's also of interest to our community. Um, as of typically, data is only available on the county level. That doesn't really speak to people that, um, or census tract level people. That doesn't really speak to people um, in terms of in relation to where they are familiar. So getting the data is probably the most difficult piece of this project. Um, if we had a health information exchange with analytics po uh, capability, it would be an easier task. We are in the process of starting an HIE. Uh, we've contracted with an, an existing HIE in Merced County, but we're still several years out from being able to pull data in an analytic uh, <laughs> capability. So what we were able to do is kind of create a workaround to where we went specifically to the FQHCs, who are our biggest servers of our Medi-Cal population in Merced County. And 51% of our county is on Medi-Cal, so that is a, a sizable proportion of our, our client population. One of the barriers for that was HIPAA. So what we did was we created a data agreement um, that was based off of the OSHPID data agreement, which is hospital data from the state for people who are not familiar. There's a very stringent data sharing agreement with OSHPID, but the idea is because you are the county health organization, you have a right to that data. So we mirrored um, agreements for each FQHC after the OSHPID data and followed the same data security protocols. So um, I'm going to actually show you the project itself, but just as a very high-level overview, um, with this data, we're able to get basic demographics, where, uh, but then you uh, clean, the cleaning and geocoding of the data itself was a little, is a bit time-intensive. And then what we used here was ArcGIS, which is a mapping program. It's the most common mapping program. Um, it is a little bit pricey. There's a free version as well, but um, we, used, we were able to... Uh, purchase the, the, the cost version through a grant. Okay, so before I get into the mapping, just to give you a bit, a bit of the demographics of this data, um, for our age breakdown, we're seeing that um, it's bulking up around our, our middle age to older adults. Um, so 50% are between the ages of 45 and 64, and then 30% are 64 plus. Again, what this is uh, clients with depression as well as either diabetes or heart disease. The breakdown is weighted highly towards female. We suspect that this is based on the um, inclusion of depression, the, the, that everybody in this population has depression because uh, females tend to be diagnosed at higher rates with depression. Um, the race ethnicity breakdown that we saw, this is only for one of our two FQHCs. We're working with the second FQHC to redo the data pool to include this information. So this is only on one of them. Um, but mi it mirrors pretty well our uh, county population with the majority of people be identifying as Hispanic Latino. It's almost 70%, followed by 24% uh, white. Um, and then for our language breakdown, again, this is only for the one clinic. Um, 
Over 50% of the patients identify Spanish as their preferred language or their first language. 40% is English. And then we have um, a decent amount of both Punjabi and Portuguese. With this particular clinic system, this was expected. Uh, the city that is the hub of this clinic system has a large Punjabi-speaking population. And then on the west side of the county, we have a couple of cities that have large Portuguese populations as well. So for the disease breakdown, again, everybody has diabetes, but we are interested, okay, what um, chronic disease are most people presenting with? And by far, most people here, again, this is only one clinic, but most people were presenting with diabetes. This is Merced County, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, the, the county seat is in Merced. That's our largest city of about, uh, about 88,000 people. Um, second largest and closest to where we are today is Los Banos. This is, uh, city is growing at the fastest rate in Merced City because it's becoming a bedroom community for San Jose. Um, other big cities of note, we have Atwater and Livingston. Livingston is where the seat of the one FQHC is. It's Livingston Community Health. Um, our, po our Portuguese populations are here in this region and a little bit in Los Banos as well. Um, so we have six cities and 11 census-designated places. So this is, if we were to uh, plot the addresses of everybody who was in that population that I described. This is not, um, we're not able to distribute this information because um, this would be considered PHI even though it's not technically, we couldn't, you couldn't really extract it, it would still be considered PHI. So what we're able to do is then do a density analysis and collapse it down into where are the places that most of these people are con congregating. And this ends up being not surprising to people who have been working in the county um, for any amount of time, really. Um, we're seeing concentrations around South Merced and Livingston, this little unincorporated area of Winton, as well as another unincorporated area of Planada. South Dos Palos and a little bit in Los Banos. Those are all areas that we're already doing work and that we're aware of um, being, having some areas of, of high need. So going back again to the individual dots, now I've overlaid these over here are the census tracts. Um, without getting into too much detail, what you, what you have to do to um, be able to identify locations that have the highest rate is actually connect the dots to another um, geographical space. So either a census track or a census block group or another geographical space that you may have uh, access to. I chose census block um, because it's a little bit more fine-grained than census track. Typically, they have about 1,000 people in them, and so we're able to look in more detail as to where we might be seeing large rates appear. So this is um, a chloropuff map that shows, um, it shows rates as opposed to raw counts. That's important to make it be all in the same metric and comparable. Um, so the light blue here is rates from zero to two people per thousand. The dark blue is anywhere from 11 to 66.67 people per, uh, per thousand. So you can see where the more problematic areas are popping up and they're in some of those locations that I mentioned earlier. So we can put in back the, um, the place labels that we have and you see the same, um, same places that were, I mentioned, South Merced, Planada, South Dos Palos, and some in Livingston. So then I wanted to be, I wanted to look at specifically those places that were between 11 and that 66. 66 indicated that maybe we had a couple of outliers. So I did a little bit more digging. So here are um, the actual rates of all of the dark, dark blue over 11 in the top north part of the county. And I want to highlight this one. 56.2. So everywhere we're seeing like 11, 12, 13, you know, 28, that's kind of high, but this 56.2 is definitely higher than we would expect based on the rest of them. So then the same thing with the Merced and South parts of the county, you know, mostly between 11 and 15-ish, but then we see this guy, and there's our 66.67. So these two were the most outlying of the communities that we looked at. So what's here? So here we are. 
This is the, what we're looking at is actually this little triangle of space and this little weird heart shaped, um, like actual autonomous heart <laughs> um, shaped area. So, and those are the rates for those small places. The one first thing that um, popped out was that these are inflated because of PO boxes. So I did choose to include PO boxes in the geo coding because um, uh, utilizing a PO box rather than a street address is um, correlated with income level. So getting rid of PO boxes would have um, biased the study. Um, but those are all located in the city center. So, um, so both of these do include PO boxes, which is inflating it a bit, but not quite to the extent um, that you would expect, with the exception of Planada, because everybody has a PO box. The um, mail carriers there don't actually deliver mail to houses. Everybody has a PO box. And these are still known as vulnerable populations. So despite the inflation for the PO boxes, it still felt important to look at them. So let's look at these. The nice thing about uh, linking these to places is now we're able to use census data that's also linked to places to look and see what's going on in some of these blocks. So these are um, highly Hispanic Latino populations. Um, they're <coughs> relatively poor populations. So we have in Planada, uh, almost 40% of people have a household income of less than 30. In Livingston, in this little block, it's uh, over 50% of people have a household income of less than 30,000 a year. Um, there's a paucity of high school education here. So in Planada, we're in this little block area, it's um, almost 70% have less than a high school education. In Livingston, 81% here have less than a high school education. In addition, Planada is a food desert. So this is in its very beginning stages. Sure. Oh, yeah, OK. So food desert is a USDA designation for, um, that it indicates lack of access to high quality grocery stores. So it's with it, it's, um, you don't have a full service grocery store within a mile if it's an urban location or um, between three and 10 miles, depending on the definition, um, if you're in a rural location. So Planada doesn't have a grocery store at all. They have one general, Dollar General, and a taco truck and a gas station. So that's it. Um, so there's no where to purchase uh, uh, fresh produce. Um, and they have a, a bus that goes to Merced, which is about 10 miles away, but it only goes twice a day. So it takes, if you do not have a car, it's a literal day excursion to go to Merced to get food. Uh huh. Um, the total population of Planada, for, for this particular region of it, it's about 1,500. For the whole community, it's about 3,000. Any other questions? <laughs> um, so the gas stations both sell, they're both, they're gas station liquor stores. Um, I don't know the actual, I don't think they have, a, they might have one more. Yeah. But there's, there's definitely more access to liquor and cigarettes and, and things like that than healthy foods. Okay. Um, so next steps are actually going out and doing more neighborhood scans. Um, we're actually going to be working with people in an internship program to um, create GIS data to go out on the, in the field and, and map uh, sidewalks and access to food and liquor stores and things like that, um, as well as resources that are available in these communities. As I said, these are known vulnerable populations, so we are doing work in a lot of these communities already, so mapping um, uh, resources that we can build upon as well as targeting interventions. And that is it. And if I can just put, kind of pull it back to our um, integrated uh, primary care and behavioral health um, work. So uh, this, you know, we're public health people, so you know, we, we love the 60,000 foot level and looking at all of this, but it really, for our whole health partnership partners, you know, really this information helps us define uh, discreetly the population. So, in that little community of 1,500 or so in Planada, 66 uh, persons for every 1,000 1, have depression and diabetes diagnosed. So imagine the 
neighbors and family members who go undiagnosed. Those are very high rates for a small, poor population. And so it really helps our partner, our, our uh, direct service provider partners, to really think about where the population is, who the population is, and what we need to do to tailor our, our specific direct service work to them. And then on the public health side, we're very interested in looking at this data um, and then uh, doing the environmental scans of, the, of where they live. So if we discover that there's more liquor stores than grocery stores or fresh produce markets, um, you know, that really tells us something about influences on the population um, as well, their health and well-being. So that's our work, and we uh, are grateful that Blue Shield of California Foundation has funded us uh, to really get into uh, the partnerships to build the trust among the partners, as well as to enable us to look at some of these um, technology tools to defi better define our work. Thank you very much.